would practice in my room all the time. Like my mirror and I have had so many <laughs> interviews <laughs> where I'm like, imagine I'm sitting with, you know, so and so, and like, you know, and they ask me this. What would you say? I could, I could <laughs> conceive being Miss Teen, but it never crossed my mind to be Miss South Africa. Mm-hmm. And I think that seed was planted then. Um, I think it just created a space where I, for the first time, could see the impact of what being Miss South Africa could be. And for the first time, I could see myself being her. Mm-hmm. A lot of young women on social media sending me messages and asking, how do you become successful? And I was like, guys, I didn't win a competition and become successful. You know, like this, <laughs> I'm busy, you know? And then I thought about it. I was like, how did I get here? Welcome to another edition of Mindset Profits. And today I'm speaking to a coach, former, what do I call you? Coach, farmer, entrepreneur, social entrepreneur. I think, yeah, I think social tech entrepreneur talker. is all encompassing. He's <laughs> a social entrepreneur and, um, yeah. And Miss SA runner up 2015. Yes. Do you mention that still? No. <laughs> I feel like that's an expiration date. Technically, it expires the next year. So I think like after 10 years, it's like, okay. Uh, we should stop talking about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure why it's there, you know. <laughs> like, I don't know if people still care 10 years later. Is it? I don't think so. Why did you get in? I'm curious. Uh, because I was an entrepreneur back then. Uh-huh. Um, and at, at the time, I already knew that there was a huge challenge around getting women involved in entrepreneurship. So I thought if I had the pl- platform and I had access to you know, our sponsors, which at the time, um, it was one of the big hotel groups, one of the big um, phone production companies and, well, telecom providers and a couple of other people. I was like, these are great people. If these people could come together and support female entrepreneurs, it would work really well. Uh, so that's what I thought I was going to do. Okay, I'll enjoy talking <laughs> and getting to know more about that journey. Nsiki is more than just that. She is she has a tech talk out, so you can go check it out on YouTube. We'll put a link to it on the description of this video. But today we're going to talk to her experience as a coach. She is an author of a book. She's going to tell us a bit more, and she's quite passionate about mentorship, which happens to be a passion of mine as well, by the way. Yeah. So we're going to talk to mentorship, her journey in pageantry. We're going to talk to her journey as a social entrepreneur, and we'll pick up quite some nuggets on what you've learned in your journey as a coach as well. Awesome. I am curious to see how someone lives after the crown to what you are doing now. Let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say are defining moments in this journey of yours in this transition from being miss sa runner up by the way how how was that for you it was a fun experience uh, it was a taxing experience it was a long experience so i was miss south africa's second princess for 2015 but i'd actually entered three years in a row and the first two times i made it to semi-finals and got eliminated and the third time around, I didn't make it at all. Um, and they had gotten down to their top 22, I think it was, but their semifinals. Um, and you know, in the background, I was praying and whatnot, but they said we'd call you at the end of November. That was, so um, auditions were in July and they said we'd call at the end of November. November was ending on Sunday. And on Friday, I get a phone call to say that Um, We've had final judging today, and three of the girls turned out to have tattoos, and at the time, having a tattoo wasn't allowed. And so those (laughs) girls got eliminated, and they're like, you have the next high score, are you available? And I was like, oh, my bags have been (laughs) packed, thanks. Um, And then I went through, and I went from like literally not being shortlisted to being recalled into the competition, to being top five on the stage answering a question, and then top three. So I think the mental resilience of being able to persist at that particular goal three years in a row, even in the face of rejection. Um, and I think even in the face of rejection where I knew why the rejection was there was like intense, right? And I think it was one of those things where it's how badly do you want this and how important is this to you? How important is it for you to prove a point? And can you get back up again when you're like, oh my goodness. I how bad did this. you want it though? <laughs> three years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and where, then, did, where did that come from? What made you stick it out for that long? 
so I'm, I'm, I'm highly competitive. I'm, I'm very competitive. <laughs> and, and I don't like to lose. So that's one of the things. But um, there's something sometimes about being rejected. And it's also because I knew why that it created an environment where I was like, there's a, I have a point to prove. I, like, so it, it was almost like you. a challenge to be like, oh, you think I can't do it because of this. Let me show you. And then... They would tell you why you were not selected to go to the finals. It wasn't a direct thing, but it was an issue that came up in a lot of my interview rounds with the judges. And so ultimately, I knew that that was like a main problem for them, that I didn't fit a specific aesthetic that was required for the pageant at the time. And I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Because last I checked, you know, it was a pageant in Africa. So <laughs> it should... You know, take into account what African women look like from different from different backgrounds and make provision for that. And to pick up on the lessons, don't worry, I stay away from scandal. <laughs> what did that teach you, though? Yeah, so I think resilience, mm -hmm. very big thing. Um, having a positive mindset, being clear about your goals and how you're going to go about achieving that. So I didn't I didn't wake up one day and decide to enter Miss South Africa. I, I knew at 16. So when I was 16, I did Miss S18, 15. I did Miss South Africa teen and I made it to the top 12 back then. And it was the same year Miss South Africa was celebrating, I think it's 30 years or something. So all the previous pageant winners were there. I think they're celebrating 50 years. And it was like amazing to be in this space where you're like, oh my goodness, there's like Bassi and Joan and, you know, Vanessa, like all of these women that you had watched on TV and you're like, oh my goodness. And then I think there was something, and then at the time Miss SA and Miss Teen were done together. So mm. when you're 15, and you're doing lunch and dinner with the Miss SA contestants at the time who are 21 20 to 25. And they, they just seem so grown up. You're like, <laughs> yo, these people know what they're doing with their lives. And I want to be like them. Um, and I specifically remember at the time, my roommate was uh, Zoe Brown. And Zoe was a year older than me. And she was like, I want to be in South Africa. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's bold. I would have never thought about it. Like, I, mean, I, could, I could conceive <laughs> being Miss Teen. But it had never crossed my mind to be Miss South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think that seed was planted then. Um, I think it just created a space where I, for the first time, could see the impact of what being Miss South Africa could be. And for the first time, I could see myself being her. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in varsity, I was like, OK, I want to be Miss South Africa, but I want to finish my studies first because I don't want to have to come back to campus after I've studied. Mm -hmm. So I only entered in my third year of uni because I, I finished with my undergrad. Then the second time I entered, I was doing my honors. And the third time I entered, I was out of school. So that strategic planning of, yes, I want this particular thing, but when is the best time for me to pursue this particular thing, I think is an important lesson and something that I apply in my life mm -hmm. um, across different disciplines. And then also, how do you prepare yourself? You know, So it's easy to want something, but you have to put in the work for that particular opportunity, even before the opportunity presents itself. You know, So mm. um, if you're in South Africa, you have to un like answer questions in public. You have to do interviews with the judges. I practice in my room all the time. Like my mirror and I have had so many <laughs> interviews <laughs> where I'm like, imagine I'm sitting with, you know, so and so, and like, you know, and they ask me this. What would you say? You know, mm. or like I'd listen to uh, talk radio and listen to like topical issues and how different people would debate and go, okay, what is the most a political opinion you can form mm. on this and how would you answer those questions you know so those are things that in the same way that you job you prepare for a job interview you know those were things that i was doing behind the scenes plus eating well and going to the gym and all of those things and going okay once this opportunity presents itself i am ready on all accounts i've had chats with many ladies that say they attribute pageantry to building their confidence and ability to speak on a stage yeah was that the same for you does it really build confidence? Because the question I ask them is, if there's 100 of you and only one is going to win or three are going to get the mention, doesn't that do the opposite <laughs> to your confidence if you're number 20 or 30? Or it can. So for me, my response to that is it depends on your own mindset. So mm -hmm. if you know how to take loss and convert it into something that allows you to thrive, then it can be a learning opportunity. But mm -hmm. if you're somebody who takes loss and goes and internalizes it and says, I'm not good enough, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not that, then it's not the best place for you to go <laughs> ahead, right? And I would say, I mean, ideally, like, have, having some skin in the game by the time you get there. So um, I've been doing pageants since primary school uh, all the way until Miss SA. 
I lost every single pageant I did <laughs> since grade three. Like I've never placed, I've never been called back. I've never like none of it. Right. But like I said, I'm very competitive. Goodness. So my thing is like, get better at it. Right. <laughs> and so from but, grade three, <laughs> from grade three. Nah. so by the time I did miss, when I, by the time I did miss teen, which was grade 10, I had had since grade three experience of fail, <laughs> failing <laughs> at the thing, but it did build confidence in that. I guess the first time you do it, you're like are terrified on stage, right? And mm. sometimes moving past terror, moving past fear, moving past nerves just requires you to be exposed to the same environment enough times for you to eventually be able to know how do I get a hold of my own feelings when okay. I'm in this position, you know? Uh, but I think you can, get, you can get that anyhow. You know, so as a speaker, I'll say to people, um, doing announcements at school, doing public speaking and debating at school, doing I stayed a foot in school, um, volunteering just to like read the names at assembly, you know, or on mm. the microphone at the office when they were doing sports announcements or whatever it is. I would always volunteer for those kinds of things. I'd be terrified. <laughs> I would be <laughs> like extreme, just do it anyway. I'd be extremely nervous. Like my hands would be shaking. And I I mean even other kids would come to me and be like, yo, you were shaking so much during like the assembly. And I was like, I know, but I did it, right? Um and what it's done for me is I can say I have all of my primary school and high school years of experience of standing in front of people on stage where they, they're saying, and now we'll have a recital from grade three or, you know, reading out something much longer. You have that experience and that experience builds confidence. So I don't think it's the pageant itself. I think it's how you coalesce different experiences that teach you how to be confident, how to show up in yourself and master yourself and then move past the fear in that so the assumption I heard listening to them was that maybe there's some special master classes that they put you guys through. Some pageants do. Some South Africa does do uh, workshops where you think there'll, there'll be a, a professional um, stage presence person that comes in and says, you know, this is how you walk, this is how you stand, this is how you articulate, and so forth. But I don't. I, for me personally, I felt like those were things that by the time we were learning them, it was more of a sharpening your skills versus ah. I think if I had to come in and learn those things for the first time right there and then. You are not going to get it. No. You know, so, so I think it's, it's, I've been doing all of this other stuff in the background and now a professional speaker comes in and says, oh, do you know when you're on stage, if you do this instead of that, it helps manage your, manage your tone. And then I'm like, oh, that's smart. Okay. But now I'm like, oh, I've been on stage. I know what it feels like to be nervous on stage. This is how I've been trying to counter it. And now I've got professional advice on how to manage that. But I think if you're coming in cold and you've never done anything, or if you're a very shy person, th there's no fast track to just <laughs> being what, amazing What on stage. tips do you have? This wasn't part of the podcast, actually. But now that you're saying it so well, I can't not ask. Yeah. What tips do you have for someone who wants to learn how to speak and have presence on a stage? So my first thing is just get out there. So whether you volunteer somewhere, whether it's your place of worship, whether it is your place of work, if there's ever an, even if it's at school, right? If there's ever an opportunity to be in front of people, make an announcement, um, send a message, whatever it is, put yourself in positions where you have to talk. Even if it's not a lot of people, you know, sometimes people are afraid to talk to people who are senior to them. So yeah. just send a message to you know someone important and go, hey, so-and-so said to tell you this. Put yourself in that, in that position. And I think one, that helps you learn what you feel like when you are nervous. And then two, it helps you figure out how to start managing the way you feel when you're nervous. So I can go, oh, okay, last time I spoke to Ntandu, I was feeling like this. Okay, let me practice. And then let me do it better this time, right? You, you can track that. You can control that in your own, in your own environment. Um, and then if you're very serious about it, I'd suggest joining groups where you are in a position to practice your speaking and getting feedback, you know, so whether it is a local debate or public speaking team, whether it's a professional chapter underneath um, Toastmasters or the Professional Speakers Association or whatever it is, find those kinds of spaces where you can actually hone in your craft and start practicing. And then you don't need to get an invitation to speak to somewhere. So if you know that there's a conference coming up, again, whether it's at a place where you volunteer or your place of worship, and you just put your hand up and say, hey, could I please assist by doing this? That gives you an opportunity to be on stage and to start practicing. All right, so from that time, and now you learned, or oh, you honed your skill with speaking, how did the book happen? Because one thing with your book, I read somewhere, you launched it during that time? 
Uh, shortly after. Shortly after. Yeah, so and you launched it as well internationally. I did, yes. Uh, so it, it, it actually happened on the back of doing my South Africa. I found myself in a position where I had lessons learned along a journey of success because I truly believe that success is a journey. You don't wake up and arrive at your destination and be like, yeah, I'm successful. <laughs> like, success looks different in different seasons of your life. Um, so one was I had those questions, but prior to that, I, I like to write, I like to journal. So even when we were around sponsors and executives in the former South Africa, whatever, I found I was learning at a very rapid rate and I realized there was no way I could retain all that information. So I started writing notes to myself. I was like, hey, remember this, you know? And also some of the lessons were like irrelevant, you know? I remember um, one of our sponsors had a, was a sponsor for uh, one of the rugby teams and we were in the executive booth at a rugby game around like, <laughs> very senior, very executive, very wealthy people. And they were talking about like horses and yachts. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I mean, not relevant, but I'll go home and write those down in case I want to buy a horse one day. You know, now I have a tip on how to know which horse to buy, but very irrelevant oh. for me right now. Um, so I, I had a bunch so of So you still letters. have those? I still have those. Um, so that's what I did. And so when, when I got the messages on social media about how did you become successful, I started mapping out different parts of my life that I considered to have found success in and the lessons that I had learned and who I had learned those lessons from. So for me, being able to articulate that was, was important, but also being able to sh showcase that mentors come from anywhere was also important for me. So I only have two mentors that I met through my South Africa experience. The rest of my mentors I know from different spaces. And I think people had the assumption that because I did my South Africa, I was able to access great mentors. Powerful mentors. Yeah, and I'm like, no, I have, so my book is like 13 chapters, and only two of those chapters are mentors that I met through my South Africa, but everybody else are people that I've met before that, um, or through my other work and initiatives. And I think also just highlighting for people that you start working on your stuff before the mentor, right? Whether a mentor comes or not is not an excuse to not get started. So I have mentors that they found me on the way failing and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm trying to do this thing. <laughs> Can I get some insight? And they've been able to assist, you know? And then I have other mentors where I've said, okay, I think I'm finishing this chapter. I think this is what I want to do next. I'm just not sure how to leap to that level. And they've given me tips on how to do that. And I think that's very important that people don't wait to have access to executives, celebrities, or whoever it is that they before admire. Before they start. Before they start. Or even before they start connecting with mentors, right? Like, um, I have a whole chapter in my book that's dedicated to my parents and my grandmother, who are my fundamental first-tier mentors. And I learned a lot from them. Even when I thought I wasn't learning, I learned a lot from them. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be proud. <laughs> if, I, if I were to ask you how to go about finding the right mentor, what would your take be? I actually have a formula for this, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the only way. So what I say to people is firstly think about your goals, right? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Because you can't find a mentor if you're not sure where you want to go. So think about your goals. So break your life up into your career, your education, your finances, your health, uh, mm -hmm. mental, spiritual, physical, emotional, um, your relationships, whether it's romantic or family relationships, friendships, corporate or professional relationships. Break it down into as many segments as you want. I like those five. And then go, okay, these are my goals in these particular areas. For the next three to five years, the first time I did this exercise was with one of my mentors. I was 23, and we set a seven-year time frame for when I was 30. And she was like, okay, when you wake up at, on your 30th birthday, what does your life look like? Where do you want to be in these different areas? So I set my goals back on that, and then we reverse engineered. And we go, okay, so to get there, we need to start by doing these things. You know, So an example is, by 30, I want to have a master's degree, fantastic. On average, a master's takes two years, plus the process of getting in, plus maybe the process of um, fundraising if you don't get a scholarship or whatever it is. So maybe yeah. set aside four to five years for your master's, including the time it's going to take to get in and all of that. So by the time you're 25, you should be applying for your master's, right? So yeah. you're able to work back on those particular things. And then once you have those goals, you can look at them and say, okay, these three things I know how to do, but these ones, I don't know how to do them. So I need to find a mentor that can help me in these particular areas. And then you go look for mentors for those particular things. So you can look in your 
personal circles. So your own network, who are your friends, who are your family, where do these people work? Who do these people have access to? You know, so sometimes we know people, but we have no idea who they are when they're not in our social setting. Yeah. And the very person you see every Sunday at church could be somebody who corporately can help you meet a specific career goal if you just ask them, right? So look in your own network. And then even for them, they have an, a broader network. So if you are clear on your goals, you can then say, hey, Ndandu, you know, I'm looking to start a TV channel. And I know you're in podcasting. Do you know anybody that does TV mm. channels, right? So you're in my network, but you could know somebody else that can help me get going on that particular path. Um, and then looking at your particular place of work or your place of study. So who's in the building? Who's, who works for the company? You know, if there's more than one office location, who works here? And can I ask these people around any of my goals to support me if I've, if, I, if I've seen somebody who's good at those particular things? And then looking at your industry as a whole, go online and say, hey, Google, who are the best professional speakers in the world? And Google will give you a list of those professional speakers and you will find them on LinkedIn and you connect and you say, hey, um, and, and connect topic specific. So go, okay, these are the best speakers in the world. I'll look through all their profiles and I see, okay, these ones are the best ones on mentorship, on women empowerment, on social entrepreneurship. I want to connect with these ones because that's a space that I'm interested in. And then you message them, you say, hey, I'm starting out my career as a speaker in this field. You know, this is my qualification. I'd like to get guidance from you because I've seen that you've succeeded in these areas, right? So there's a link between what you're trying to do and who that mentor mm. is, right? And also just to show that you've done a little bit of research. So don't message somebody and say, hey, can you help me become a professional speaker? <laughs> That you can ask ChatGPT. Do you know what I mean? Like, come come with like a question that shows that you you've taken ownership over the thing that you're saying. You want like to what, for example? So a better question is, um, I've been working on being a professional speaker. I've mm. joined this chapter. I've designed this. I'm stuck between how do I translate this message from here to here. You know, um, so I'm a, so I'm a really great speaker within my church community, and I've done many youth programs. But I'm not at a place where I want to shift my speaking into the corporate environment, and I'm struggling to figure out how to bridge that gap. That's a question that shows me that you've done your work, that you understand what the message is that you want to get out, that you know who you want to talk to. I can then say, Nando, I see what you're trying to do. I don't think your voice is well suited to this group. Mm. Have you thought about talking to these people? And I can help you redirect, right? But you've come to me with a plan that we can adjust. Where I think the mistake a lot of people make is they go, Dando, please mentor me. Yeah, I get that a lot. And it's like, okay, on what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I could mentor you on a million things. What do you What do you want from me, right? Um, but also respect the fact that your mentor has things happening in their lives, right? So time is a very sensitive thing. So you want it to be very clear about what it is that you need and where it is that you want to go. And even if that person helps you to redirect that, at least you started with some kind of framework. Um, and then my last thing is a perfect stranger. So I'm a big believer that when you're on the path of searching and finding and you're telling people like, hey, Dando, I'm looking for a mentor in this space, someone somewhere will hear about you and be like, hey, so-and-so told me about you and I'd be keen to mentor you. So don't, and I just say that because I've, I've had many encounters where I wasn't looking, but somebody heard and then connections were made. Is there a reason why you're calling them a perfect stranger? Because it's just a good fit. They were a stranger, <laughs> but the, the, the fit turned out to be really good. So it's somebody that I've never asked, I've never approached, but because I was asking friends and family and, and mentors and other people to say, hey, I'm trying to get into this space. Can you help me out? Somebody knew somebody and said, hey, there's this young girl. Oh, by the way, there's this girl. Here's her number. And then we had coffee and then it was like, oh my goodness, this is great. This I would have works. never found you by myself, you know? <clears throat> you, you mentioned a couple of things around once the mentor is there. How do I become valuable to the mentor, one, and how do I ensure that I actually get value from the relationship? Because I've seen instances where there is a mentor, the mentor mm -hmm. is quite knowledgeable, but the student or mentee is available but not learning. Yes, reciprocity. So I'm a big believer if you're being mentored, we don't move forward until you've done the first batch of assignments, if we can say, right? Mm. So if we have a meeting and I, and I say to you, Dando, I want to get into the podcasting space and you say to me, okay, a great place for you to start is to find who are the best female black podcasters in your age group. 
let's have a conversation after that, right? And you say, what do you like about them? What is their content? What is what do you think is missing about their content? What would you do better about their content? That's the, that's your homework to me as my mentor. Yeah. And then I don't do it. <laughs> and then we have our next meeting, and then I'm like, oh, I kind of started, but then I didn't, you know, and then I have all these excuses. That doesn't show my commitment to the learning journey, right? Um, and that doesn't show my focus in what I'm doing, and that doesn't honor your time, right? And then more than that, it doesn't give you a framework for something to work with. So if I come back and I say to you, I've looked at, this is what I found, this is what I saw, this is what I think is missing. We can now have a conversation where you can say, great, but you didn't look at any of these kinds of podcasts. Why is that? Oh, I see what you noticed about them. That's very much from your lens. But did you notice that this also works really well around their podcast? And then we can say, oh, okay, these are things that don't work. Have you thought about adding value in these ways? Do you know what I mean? So you're... Mentors are not there to teach you in the format of how we do school. So you're not sitting in a lecture hall and your mentor is just giving you information. It's a conversation. It's me coming to the table with my knowledge, my challenges, where I'm stuck, the, the work that I've taken on and committed to do, and then coming back to you and saying, oh, it's not working here. I tried to call these people. I tried to do this. I tried to do that. And this is where I'm failing. But if I can show you where I'm failing, you can give me input on how to move on and do the next thing. So I think mentorship relationships don't work, one, but there's no reciprocity. And because you don't pay your mentors, reciprocity shows up when you're going, look, I've done the work and these are my results. And that's really mm -hmm. what mentors want to see. They want to see that you've put in the effort. And you can't, you can't have your mentor more committed to your dreams than you are, right? <laughs> Which happens all the time. It's like, you want this. And if you want this, you need to put in the work for that particular thing. Um, and then the other thing is, I think people don't clearly define what their mentorship relationship is going to look like in the beginning. So mentorship, it's not, it's not as joy. Like, it's not a... <laughs> That's your example. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it's not a, let's go with the flow, we'll see. I mean, I even knocked you all, I'm just like, set your expectations up front, but that's a different chat. Um, set, set up your, your, your expectations up front. You know, so as a mentor, you can say... I will manage your expectations. This is how I mentor, or this is what I'm going to get out of what I can give in this relationship. And the mentee should also say, this is what I can give. So if I'm coming onto this podcast with you yeah. and I'm being mentored by you, and my expectation is that Untando can connect me to Oprah, mm. you need to let me know up front that you don't have that kind of <laughs> network. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because people do come into their mentor relationships and think, oh, this person is going to get me a job, or this person can get me the million, whatever investment that I need for my business. And it's like, no, this person has expertise. And with their expertise, they can support you to the next step. But they, are, they don't have a magic wand that's going to fix all your problems. So clearly defining expectations up front, and then defining how do we work. So do we do email? Do we do phone calls? Do we do WhatsApp? Um, do we meet once a week, bi-weekly, once a month? And how much uh, progress do I want to see in that time? And then you take it from there, right? And I think when you have that kind of um, buy-in or agreement up front, then you know what each person is doing and everyone can then come out that relationship happy. Would you call yourself a mentor or a coach to those that you're helping? I do both. Mm. Um, I think I've been a mentor longer than I've been a coach. And mentorship for me shows up very different to how I coach. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily I, just, I wouldn't necessarily mentor the same way that I coach. Is it? Yeah. And I just got curious with the way you were answering. There's there's content that you've shared around powerful women in the Bible that inspire you. Yeah. Love that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you found it. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I was like, ah, no one's gonna see that. <laughs> I found it. Thanks. Took us through one or two women mentors of yours from the Bible. Love Esther. I think Esther, sorry, not Esther, Deborah. Uh, I think well, Deborah Esther, is... Esther makes sense because Miss S.A., you... And funny enough, it's... Esther was my girl. That was my scripture <laughs> during... during uh, <laughs> that was one of my, my scriptures that I drew inspiration from. Uh, but Deborah, I love. And I think Deborah is somebody who's not spoken about a lot. Also, we don't know a lot about Deborah, but what we know about Deborah for me, I think, is sufficient. Um, mm. I'd love to know more, but we know enough. Uh, so Deborah is one of the judges that served um, in the book of Judges, but for the children of Israel before they had a king. Um, and Deborah serves in a time where she is knowledgeable about the things of the kingdom. She's knowledgeable about uh, the things of the church. She's a prophet or a teacher in the church. Um, but she also understands military prowess, right? So there comes a, a time where the children of Israel need to go to war. And 
for whatever reason, a man couldn't be found, or I don't, I don't know who was supposed to go to war, but there was, there was, the dudes weren't around, right? Um, but Deborah goes, oh, no, 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 you can call Uzban Bani to go. Mm. And, and there was the, the, the custom at the time was that people would go to war with the prophet. So the prophet would pray or lead the way or, or give a sense of confidence. Where they would say, you know, the Lord is on our side and mm. things will be fine. Um, and so this, I, f- I forget the name of the guy, but this gentleman says to Deborah, I won't go to war if you don't come with me. Mm. And she goes, cool. I will come, but if I come in the capacity that you're wanting me to come and we win, it would be said that I won the war, not you. And he says, I'm cool with that as long as <laughs> as win. long as you're there and we win, <laughs> let's go. And I think there's a lot of things that I take from um, the account of Deborah. One was the way that she was able to exercise wisdom in her position um, from a place of collaboration instead of a place of... Dominance. Um, dominance or instruction. I think that's very important. Not as a female leader, as a leader in general, I think. Excellent leadership is showcased by your ability to get by and from the people that you are leading. Uh, secondly, her ability to inspire confidence in people. I think there's, we don't, we don't entirely, um, I want to say her wisdom, but we don't know everything about her character as a person, whether she was enthusiastic or quiet, we don't know those kinds of things. But there was mm. something about her that inspired the kind of confidence that people were like, okay, if Deborah comes, we're going to be fine, right? Or we want her to come with us. And I think that's a very important thing, not just for if you're in business or if you're in leadership running a team, but just as a person, if you're running a household, you want to be the kind of parent that inspires the confidence in you that people go like, yeah, if you're not, if you're not here, this doesn't work, you know? Um, and then I think her humility is something that really stands out for me. And then finally, her fearlessness, that even in the face of a challenge, in this case, an army, she was bold enough to say that, oh, no, I know if I go, we win. Mm. And I think that, ugh, I love it. I love it. I think it's just, it's just it's, it's a, it's, I think it's a mindset of being, you know. So I don't think she was speaking to her ability that she has the power to win. But what she believed in, and I'll say God, is that she knew that from her belief and from the God that she served, that with my strategy and if we go in, I know I'll emerge victorious. And I think moving in life with that degree of confidence is a very important thing and i, I love and that and your word. belief is it's important for women to learn from such women yes because i think a lot of the stories we or the women we hear that are profiled in the bible are profiled for womanly things which are mm. wonderful and we need le- leadership in those areas but i don't think we say enough around how women are leaders in society and in business and in corporate and in government in general and Deborah for me is a really excellent example of what that looks like. Okay. Let's name a second a one. Second one. Um You had seven. So. I had so many. I'm trying to think. You know, okay, so You even had Eve. I was shocked. Yes, you know, because <laughs> Eve gets a bad rap, guys. Eve gets a bad rap and Hi, man. Eve, guys, she just made a mistake. <laughs> like, it's a costly one. But I look, I don't want to unpack Eve right now because I have a lot of thoughts around Eve as an entire Bible study. So yeah. I, won't, I won't unpack that right now. But I'll say um, in this particular season of my life, Mary and Martha, mm-hmm. um, Mary, for me, is somebody that I, I, I would maybe highlight in being teachable. You know, so even in the context of there's a lot of things happening and yes, we need to make food to feed people and these people are coming in, we need to prepare this. And like there's always demands in your life of things that need to be done. And in the chaos of everything that's happening, Mary sits down at the feet of Jesus just to learn. And I think that's a very beautiful thing that learning to prioritize yourself in any season, even when there's a lot of demands around you and to go, I cannot do all of this if I don't take the time to sit down and learn feed my spirit replenish myself whatever it is and but the, but also in that is being teachable right so i know if people come to the house these are the preparations that need to be made i know how to make these preparations i'm skilled i've got experience like i know how to do this and i think sometimes when you're moving in a space where you know what to do and you know how you're supposed to do it and you have experience you miss being teachable in that season even on the same set of skills right and sometimes it's if you just adjust the same skill in this way you'll achieve Mm. much greater results and so for me in this particular season it's just pausing and being teachable pausing and being teachable and taking care of yourself yes what what should that be like for entrepreneurs? What message? How would you apply it to an entrepreneur? 
So for entrepreneurs, is setting up time to spend time in your business and on your business, very important. Mm-hmm. Um, and to also understand that your business can only be as good as what you are good. So whether it's from a place of rest and going, the energy that fuels your business is how you show up as a founder on a Monday, whether that's inspiring your team or whether you don't have a team and it's just you and going, do you have enough energy to do all the tasks that are required? Um, and the second one is from a skills perspective, you can only grow your business as far as you know how to do certain things, which does mean that at some point you have to in- interplay between I'm working on this thing and I'm building it and versus I'm going to sit and take some time to learn how to do a particular skill so I can go back and apply it in my business, which means, unfortunately, sometimes you are taking out time to sit in a coaching session or an accelerator mm. program or do a course online or something, right? But you're taking the time. And this is a hard thing for entrepreneurs that because for a long time we're solo founders and there's, if you're not in the business, there's no one else there. Um, there's a fear of I can't step away from the business because no transactions will happen. And it's to say, sure, but if you don't step away and learn this particular thing, you can't make any more transactions happen. So being OK to go, OK, cool, I've, I've done well this week. I'm going to sit outside and very deliberately set aside time to learn, whether that's in the evenings or over the weekends or on a day when you know your business is not really busy on this particular day. Set aside that time and, and make the effort to learn and grow your own skills. So you you are laughing at me when I was saying I don't have weekends <laughs> of the time I'm at work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's bad. There's definitely seasons in your business where you're going hard and it's, you know, all hands on deck and we're working way more than usual. But that should not be the norm, right? And I think oftentimes people correlate success and being productive with being super busy, right? So people feel like, oh, I'm, I'm here and we're moving and we're doing stuff. And it's like, sure, but you're not actually being productive. And you're not mm-hmm. actually making progress in your business. And in fact, you're actually um, creating yourself or putting yourself in a space where you can burn out, right? Mm. Um, burnout, one, from being tired, but secondly, psychological burnout, where you're going, oh my goodness, I'm working so hard, but there's no results. And if you pause, you'd realize that the stuff that you're working on are not the kinds of things that bring results. And that's very important. So for me, that, that self-management, that teachable spirit as an entrepreneur is very important. Also, because I know you love your business. I know your <laughs> business is amazing. I know all of these things about your business. You're not the first one to do it. Right. Yeah. So being teachable in the sense where you can go to someone else and if that person says ah, this thing, it's not going to work because of one, two, three, that you listen. Right. And I, I mean, I, I, I had this I'm busy raising at the moment for a platform and I spoke to an investor last week and he gave me all the reasons why the platform is not going to work. And I was like, OK, but I really want to build this platform, though. And then he was like, cool, you can, but build it once you've answered how you're going to counter each of these challenges. Right. And I think that is important because then you just spend another three months, six months banging your head against a wall that just isn't going to come down. And somebody else has already told you this doesn't work this way, right? So yes, the goal is still to do X, but how do I approach doing X from a different perspective? Or how do I adjust X? So maybe X is a wonderful thing, but it's not actually the solution that people want. It's not actually the solution people are willing to pay for. Okay, so how do I reimagine what that looks like? So being teachable also means, and I'm not talking about people who just completely are like, you're never going to be successful. Don't listen to those people. But I mean, people who have experience in what you're trying to do and can say to you, we did that and this is how we failed. But if you can figure this out, then maybe you'll be more successful. Listen to that input. It's very helpful. That would be. So if someone says, actually, let me ask, what are your favorite lessons from some of the mentors? I know that's a tough one because you have 13 chapters. Yeah. Um, A really big lesson for me is... um, So in my 20s, I was very clear about the fact that I wanted to have a career as a professional speaker. And, you know, I was like, I want to travel the world. I want to speak in different countries. And I want to work with corporates and different people around the world. And and, and, and. And one of my mentors um, sat me down, Vanessa Blue, and she's so wonderful. And she was like, fantastic, you can do it. But is that what you see yourself doing at 50? All right. And she was like, very specific. She was like, understand that the older you get, the energy you have right now won't be there, right? And so if you're building your entire business around you being the speaker and the person who's delivering the solution or who's facilitating the workshop or whatnot, is that sustainable for you long term? And I remember when I first heard it, I was like, yeah, like I'm always going to love traveling. But when she broke it down, I was like, yeah, maybe at 50, I don't want to be sitting 
in airport trying to catch flights, you know, because I mean, yes, you, you fly to the destination and then you deliver your work, but majority of your trip is the flight, you know, like South Africa to London is like 11 hours if you're flying direct. Yep. And then if you're catching a connecting flight to anywhere else, it's, you know, three to five hours, depending on how long your layover. Like, do you want to be doing that <laughs> at 50? And I was like, no, actually, I, I, I don't, right? Um, so then it was going, okay, cool. So how do you reimagine your business as a professional speaker and what the kinds of services you offer are and how people consume those particular services? And that was a big shift for me to then go, okay, how do I do um, online learning? How do I do courses? How do I take what I, the message I want to share with people and distill it in different formats for people to engage with it without me having to be there. Um, how do I look at doing um, sort of train the trainer programs where you can maybe design a specific methodology that people utilize that you've created, but those people are then free to go facilitate on your behalf and maybe licensing something, you know? So there's, so it put me in a position where I've started investigating other things that I was like, okay, this is perhaps a better business to build that's not just dependent on me being there physically to facilitate. And then where does social entrepreneurship come in? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, social entrepreneurship, I think for me, is a very missed thing. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, I, I hate to say especially in Africa, but especially in Africa, right? In the sense that we do have a lot of social problems, right? We're not the West. Um, even though we live in a world that encourages us to consume in the same way that the West does, we're not the West. And so we still do have a lot of base level Maslow's hierarchy of needs challenges that we have not solved as a society, right? And the traditional models of saying businesses are meant to maximize shareholder value just are not going to work in this context. Um, and they're also not going to work in a context where other countries have been able to build their wealth on other countries, but that's a chat for them. <laughs> um, so answering the question of how do we solve our social problems in a way that is sustainable? Yeah. And in a way that... Um, Benefit society with the understanding that if everybody is fed, has shelter, has food, has access to, you know, water, electricity and so forth, what you've done is raise the base level of everybody in society and therefore you have a better consumer generation for the next level, right? Mm. Um, whereas oftentimes I find that sometimes the translation of how the NGO industry runs from funders to those on the ground executing is almost designed to keep people in a state of poverty, that the donations only flow if, for as long as people are in need. Mm -hmm. And I think the shift needs to say, how do we stop these people being in need? You know, so let's say hunger is a challenge. How do we shift people from hunger to, and getting you know, food parcels and food packs and um, those squidgy things that have like, <laughs> whatever it's called, you know? How do we shift from that to, we've taught all these communities how to become subsistence farmers and now they're mm. able to grow their own food and not only do they do that they now grow a surplus where they're able to provide to a market that's close by that they can sell to right and then you can explore a bunch of different things where you go this community grows this crop that one grows this crop and we're able to cross share amongst each other so i think a lot of our problems can be solved as a society but also translate to sustainability and profitability if we look at it from a social entrepreneurship perspective which means we're considering the entire ecosystem it also means we're considering alternative um, revenue models or economic models or business models in terms of how we do things um, and we're also challenging the status quo Mm. So I, I think a lot of traditional business, and this is where I think the West or large corporate needs to be responsible from a social entrepreneurship perspective, is that yes, you're maximizing shareholder value, generating however many billions a year, but you've destroyed the water system in the process. You know, um, you've destroyed a forest in the process. You've dumped a bunch of oil in the ocean. You have um, exploited women and children in... Um, factories and so forth. And that's not, that can't be economically productive, right? Uh, and s traditionally, as things are, those companies are celebrated regardless of the ill practices, mm. right? And I think if you're thinking about social entrepreneurship, there's a lot of cross lays between stuff. So it's amazing. I love the story. It's amazing that you can get a Coca Cola everywhere you go. Wow, right? <laughs> and I think it's bizarre that you can't get medication everywhere you go. And so I think surely Coca Cola has figured something out around their logistics. <laughs> that we should say, hey, do you want to take medication where you're taking those Cokes into those very remote villages where nobody has access to X, Y, Z? Um, and I think if we're able to explore those kinds of models where big corporates have figured it out, 
but uh, hold them accountable to being more sustainable and having better practices, not just for scoring ESG points. Um, I think through social entrepreneurship, we're able to do business better. And that's good for everybody. <laughs> I'm thinking about this logistics example <laughs> you're giving with Coke and medicine. I think there was a joke around that, that SAP breweries should deliver books. Yes, because <laughs> they make it everywhere. They do. They yeah, they've they got make reach. it everywhere. They've got reach everywhere. If I can and get a black let, label, I should be able to get a book. And we let those the powers that be deliver alcohol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I think the last thing that I would like us to to talk to, because we've talked about the social entrepreneurship. Don't you see? a challenge from someone who thinks social entrepreneurship failing to transition to purely a for-profit business? No, I don't. Because So the assumption is that people think that social entrepreneurship means that you're not making profit, whereas mm. social entrepreneurship does make provision for making profit. What is different around social entrepreneurship is you can build into your business model that we will cap profit at 10%, and everything else we reinvest into the business. Or of our profit, we will commit to paying out 20% to the beneficiaries in this community. Or we will sell this particular thing, but we don't expect this group to pay for it. We expect those people to pay for it, right? So there's different, so there is profit, but the challenge is to go, how do we rethink the way that this is structured so that it is more beneficial, right? Um, so for example, like this was a, I think it's also still current in discussion. It was, like, it was a big thing around, and I think it's happening in Europe at the moment, trying to make people pay for their carbon footprint. Okay. Okay, yes. So if you are able to get people to see how much they are impacting the environment and therefore be financially accountable for that, it should change their behavior, right? And there's pushback and so forth and fine. Um, I would say the challenge with that is that doesn't necessarily challenge the people who have the highest footprint when it comes to um, carbon emissions. But those kinds of things make a difference. So if we take that same example and we put it in fast fashion, and if you were able to get away to help people see what their purchasing of fast fashion is impacting overall, that people would change their buying decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if there was a tax that said, okay, great, you can, you can buy from Shein and Zara and whoever else you want as much as you want, but every time you make a purchase, you'll be charged a eco-tax and you'll be charged a underminers work tax or factory exploitation tax because the only way you're able to have this product for seven dollars is because so three pounds or whatever is because somebody's being exploited so if you did that <laughs> you know there's you know so it's not just about um the money it's about when you're thinking about the whole ecosystem it's going how do we actually close this loop right and you can't close the loop by only making the customer responsible so Everybody in the supply chain needs to be accountable for what they're doing, what their input is, and what the um, ripple effect of that activity or that task is. Where grassroots organizations have a challenge is that they have the data, they have the information, they just don't have the funds to argue for what they're saying. So um, if we take the fast fashion um, example, there are a lot of underground organizations that are for fair trade, that are for fair wages, that have the data, that are lobbying and protesting and so forth, but they don't have the same amount of money as the bigger corporations. Mm. So social entrepreneurship comes in and says, okay, what do you guys do that you can keep doing it, but allows you to make money? So maybe you become a consulting agency that, I mean, I don't know if anybody generally wants to pay. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? So if, if, the, if a company really is saying, look, we do want to be genuine about transforming, and we hire you as a consultancy, you're now getting paid and you can continue to do the work that you do, right? And where grassroots organizations, nonprofit organizations fall apart is the fact that they are, apart from donations, oftentimes are not able to sustain their activities and therefore certain causes after some time run out because the people who are meant to be there to forge the, the fight ahead after certain time just are not able to do mm. it. And um, the other thing is people who care about that space often shift into it because they care. But if we don't have the means to do so, then you're not attracting high talent, right? And I think if you have the people that are working in the Deloitte's and Accenture's and McKinsey's of the world working in these kinds of organizations, you have the best minds applying themselves on solving social problems, and you have the kind of money that's in that environment to reward them properly for the work. Beautiful. All right, in closing, 
what words of inspiration do you have for women entrepreneurs? Because that's your passion. I'll let you go there. <laughs> I mean, my passion, I think everybody. Everybody. Everybody who wants to be an entrepreneur, um, women and men alike in, across the continent. Mm-hmm. Um, one, believe in yourself. Two, get a plan. And three, get going. I think <laughs> that was fast. Yeah, no, you know, so one, I, I far too often I see too many people who are sitting at home with great ideas who just don't speak them out loud because they don't believe in themselves, right? So in as, as great as the idea is, I want to go, oh, Dando, you'd be really good if you did this, right? And it's like, no, it's my idea. I, if I believe in myself, I should do it. Um, get a plan. doesn't mean that everything needs to be perfect. It just means I kind of have an idea of where I'm going to start and I'll figure it out as I go. But have a plan so that you're able to not just shoot in the dark, but you, you know, there's some kind of light shards at least coming in and illuminating the path. And then three, get going. It's never going to be the right time. It's never going to be perfect. You're never going to have enough money to start. You're never going to have the right product. Just go. And what I have found is that in your going, things get better. So it's mm. only when you are in the field that you're able to see one where you're lacking as a leader to how your product or your service can be improved because you're getting the feedback, you're meeting other entrepreneurs, you're actually engaging with your customer, not hypothetically, but people are telling you this sucks or yeah, we really <laughs> like this and this is why we like it, right? But take take it, don't per, don't make it personal. Just take it in and go, okay, yes, let me let me fix this, let me re-engineer, let me, let me, let me. And then you keep going and you keep doing and you get better at it and your product and your service gets better and you build your confidence and before you know it, you're like, oh my goodness, I've, I've built this thing, like it happened. So believe in yourself, get a get plan, a plan get, get going. going. Believe in yourself, get a plan, get going. That's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. It was a wonderful talk This to has you. been beautiful. Really enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for hanging with us till this time. I think it's too late to be saying we're celebrating 10K subscribers now. By the time this goes out, probably at 11. (laughs) But thank you. Thank you for all the support. We're going to continue giving you all this content, talking to other coaches and sharing valuable content that you can learn from as an entrepreneur and someone who wants to be an entrepreneur. I think we are three episodes away, four episodes away from the African tour. We will go to Kenya. So that's coming. I'm super excited to give you insights into what I've learned that side because, yo, it's going to be some really, really cool things. I love Africa. So from our side, see you on the next episode. Cheers.